Welcome back, everyone, to Chicago Football Connection Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Letizia. You can follow me on Twitter at CFC Bears. Uh, I say welcome back because it's been about a month since I've done one of these. Uh, work has been crazy. And then when I finally was did have some time to sit down and record one of these, my computer crashed. So um, it's been a rough couple of weeks for me, but I'm back. I'm excited to, to talk more about the Bears. Uh, we obviously have training camp coming up this week, so I'm doing a training camp preview. Um, I'm also going to be talking a little bit about the new uh, Bears acquisitions of Riley Reef and Michael Schofield. Um, I did record some um, some of this breakdown before they signed Riley Reef, so I'm going back and re-recording now, uh, which is a pain in the ass, but, uh, you know, we, we power through. Um, so, yeah, again, today I'm going to be talking about uh, the train camp preview, um, you know, who I'm going to be looking out for, some training camp battles that are going to be important if the Bears want to compete this year. Uh, training camp does start tomorrow on Wednesday. I guess I don't know when I'm going to be posting this. Wednesday, July 27th. Uh, it's open practice this week, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Um, I will be there on Saturday, so if anyone wants to say hi, I look like this. I'll be wearing uh, a Bears jersey most likely, so I should be easy to find. Um, so if anyone wants to say hi, please, I, I, I would love to talk to people who listen to this, anyone who shared my podcast. I owe you a beer. Um love to 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 meet more bears fans so I'll, like i said i'll be there on saturday i do have an extra ticket um so if anyone um wants it just message me or dm me on twitter and i'll i'll send that to whoever messaged me first um but now it's um excited to to get back into this now that the training camp is here uh i'll be hopefully doing more of a weekly podcast or at least every other week uh because we'll just have more stuff to talk about um so let's get right into it. We're going to start with the training camp battles, a few training camp battles, and then I'll get into Michael Schofield and Riley Reef. So before we get into the training camp battles, uh, just remember, I put together this depth chart. This is how I view the Bears' uh, depth chart going into uh, training camp here. Um, so probably not a whole lot of surprises here. Um, so you can see the the uh, dark blue are players that I think have a star spot locked up. Uh, light blue is a roster spot locked up, but maybe not a starting spot. Orange is fighting for a roster spot, and red is, you know, just camp bodies, unlikely to make the roster. Maybe could be on the um, the practice squad if they impress uh, in training camp, but I really don't see a way for them to actually make the roster coming out in training camp, barring some spectacular, unexpected play. Um, so you, you can, we'll start with the offense. Obviously, Justin Fields locked in as the quarterback. Um, it's nice to kind of go into a season knowing who your quarterback is, uh, who's going to be uh, week one and hopefully through week 18. Uh, it's been a long time since the Bears have had that. Um, at least it feels like it's been a long time. Um, uh, running back, Dave Montgomery, obviously locked into the the starting spot. Khalil Herbert, I believe, is going to uh, play a lot this year. Um, and he's going to be, even though he's not the starter, He's kind of like a de facto starter, 1A, 1B situation. Uh, I do think it's going to be more of a 50-50 split between th those two guys. Um, but I do think that's a very solid running back room. And then you got Darrington Evans and Tristan Ebner, I think, who are fighting for that third spot. Maybe both make it if they decide to keep uh, four running backs. That would, be, that would surprise me, considering they all are going to be keeping a fullback in Kari Blazing game. Um, but I do think Ebner and Evans both have a chance to make the roster. Um, Ebner... Um, I've talked about on, on previous podcasts, but I think he's a fantastic receiver out of the backfield and even can line up at receiver at times. Um, so I do think he, even though I have him listed as fourth here, I think that's where kind of where, how he enters this competition, but it would not surprise me at all if he beats out Darrington Evans for that third running back spot. So those are pretty straightforward. No real, um, no real camp battles there. It uh, gets a little bit more interesting when we move on to the other offensive positions. Um, wide receiver, I do think the th top three guys are locked in. Donna Mooney at the Z, Byron Pringle at the X, and then slot, uh, Valus Jones in the slot. I do think those guys are pretty locked in. Maybe someone beats out Valus Jones um, to be that kind of third wide receiver, uh, but I think he does have the inside shot there. Um, it gets a little bit more interesting, and I'm going to go into a little bit more in-depth there when you get to that wide receiver four spot, so that's one that I'm going to be covering kind of extensively. Um, you have Equinemia St. Brown, who I believe has a roster spot locked up, given his familiarity, familiarity with the scheme um, and with Luke Getze and his uh, experience on special teams. Um, anyone, any wide receiver you keep after those top three needs to have some sort of special teams ability, and he has the most special teams ability of all the wide receivers they have. So I do think he's a lock uh, to at least make the roster, but he could be beaten out for that wide receiver four spot. So he's a guy 
Um, I'm excited to watch Nikhil Harry. Obviously, the Bears just traded for him uh, recently, a seventh round pick, a future seventh round pick. So not a whole lot of investment there. Uh, but I do think he has an inside shot to make the roster because of that. Um, Dante Pettis, I think, um, has a chance um, to maybe beat out Bayless Jones in the slot. I, I really liked him coming out of college a few years ago, um, about five, four or five years ago now. It feels like it wasn't that long ago. Uh, but I do think he's a guy who has an inside shot to make the roster. So those three guys, are, I think, are the ones competing for that fourth roster, uh, receiver four spot. Um, you'll have other guys, David Moore, uh, Daz Newsom, Tajay Sharp, um, Simba Webster, maybe De- um, uh, Des mentioned Daz Newsom. I don't know, maybe Daz Newsom. Um, those guys kind of competing as well, but I do think they're uh, a tier below those other three guys that I mentioned. Um, so that'll be interesting to watch kind of who steps up there. Um, you can't learn a whole lot from training camp, especially um, at the wide receiver position, but uh, it'll be interesting to watch all those guys. Um, tight end, um, obviously Cole Kmet locked into the uh, Y tight end spot. Um, but that backup there is going to be very interesting. Uh, Ryan Griffin, I believe, has the inside inside track to start there. Uh, uh, not sorry, not to start there, to be the backup to Cole Komet. Um, and you do have Chase Allen, the rookie from Iowa State as well, who was a ch- who um, had you know looked pretty good in college. I think he has a chance to maybe beat out Ryan Griffin. Ryan Griffin really doesn't do a whole lot for me uh, after watching him um, with the Jets last year. Um, and he's been with the Texans as well. Um, he's a bigger guy, so he's a wide tight end only. Not really a threat as a receiver, decent blocker. Um, definitely could be an upgrade there, but I do think he has an inside chance to make the roster. Um, the U tight end is a lot more interesting. Uh, we know Cole Komet's starting at Y. U tight end, the other tight end who's going to be starting, because uh, the uh, if you watch my breakdown of the Luke Getze passing offense, they w- will be utilizing a lot of two tight end sets uh, this year, and maybe that's Komet and Griffin, uh, but I really do think that's going to be James O'Shaughnessy. Um, I, I, after watching O'Shaughnessy, I've actually came away extremely impressed with his receiving ability. He moves a lot smoother than than Griffin does. He's probably a better receiver than Cole Komet, at least at this stage in their career. Um, so I think having him um, as a little undersized guy, you know, he's only 245 pounds, whereas Komet's 270. So he moves a little bit better, a little bit quicker in and out of his cuts. I do think he could be used as a, as a really good uh, second tight end with Cole Komet more as a blocker, um, catching underneath stuff. Um, after that, there's not a whole lot to love about this tight end group. Um, I really, uh, even O'Shaughnessy, who I like, um, he's not going to be a game changer by any means. So I do think in the future, uh, more of a receiving tight end is going to be on their wish list. But you do have Rice and John, who they um, signed from the Giants, and Jake Tongs, for uh, who was an uh, undrafted free agent out of Cal. Those guys will be fighting for that fourth spot. They probably will keep four tight ends, most likely. Um, so one of those guys will probably earn that spot. Um, and then obviously on the offensive line, that's kind of what we've been talking about all offseason. Uh, the picture has become a little bit more clear now um, after the last two days with the additions of Riley Reef and Michael Schofield. Um, you know, it's interesting, you know, because we've had all these conversations. It's interesting that the Bears waited this long to sign those guys. And, you know, these guys have been free agents all, all offseason. Just curious what has changed the last two days that to made them make them, you know, pull the trigger on those deals. But I'm glad that they did. Neither a guy is a game changer, uh, but both guys give you at least a baseline average starter, um, which will help out Cody Whitehair. It'll help out Lucas Patrick. Puts a lot less pressure on them, and it'll help out whoever wins that right tackle job. So that's something you know I'm going to go into more detail today about. Um, I do think Tevin Jenkins has the inside shot at that starting right tackle job, but Larry Borum could win that. And I wouldn't be surprised if they gave Braxton Jones a chance to win that spot as well. So it's kind of a three-man competition, but I do think it's going to come down to Jenkins and Borum. I've talked a little bit on my previous podcast uh, about the offensive, late break, offensive line breakdown. I've talked about both those guys a little bit. Um, so go ahead, go back and watch that if you want to. I am going to go into them, kind of the same things I talked about there in this podcast as well, because I do think that's, that's going to be the number one camp battle uh, this year is Jenkins versus Borum. So that's the offensive side of the ball. Defensive side of the ball, uh, there's actually a lot more openings, I, I think. Um, at the cornerback positions, you got Jalen Johnson as QB1 and Kyler Gordon at QB2. Um, I don't think they're just going to hand the job to, to Kyler Gordon, but given their lack of talent at the cornerback position, I do think it's his job to lose. So I do have him slated in as a starter right now. Uh, but it really gets uh, more interesting when we get to that slot corner position. Um, they signed Tavon Young from the uh, Baltimore Ravens this offseason. Um, he's been injured 
but he has experience at that position and it has played really well as a slot corner in the past. Um, you know, it's been a few years since he's had that, that really good play, but um, it's very possible that he has a bounce back season. Um, he has all the talent in the world. So I do think he has, um, is most likely to win that job, but I do, there are a couple guys that I like. Um, Thomas Graham played really well in a, you know, a small sample size last year um, on the outside, but I do think they give him a chance to maybe compete with at slot corner, uh, considering that uh, Jalen Johnson and Kyle Gordon have those outside spots locked up. So I'd like to see him, how he performs on the inside, a position that he really hasn't played much. After that, on the cornerbacks, there's not a whole like not to like Kendall, uh, Kendall Vildor is going to get a shot uh, to compete on the outside and as probably a slot corner as well. Duke Shelley as well and, and, as a slot. But we've seen both those guys. We know who they are. Um, if they're a backup, I'm fine with it. If they have to start, the Bears are going to be in trouble. Uh, one guy I do think that is going to compete that slot corner position, I have him listed at free safety now. But that's DeAndre Houston Carson. He played slot. He played safety and slot corner last year. Um, I thought he played extremely well. Um, and I would give him the opportunity to kind of compete at that slot corner position. So that's something that I'll be looking out for as well. Um, speaking of safeties, again, kind of the top two guys are locked in. Eddie Jackson, free safety. Shaquan Brisker, the second round pick at strong safety. Um, hopefully Jackson can um, can uh, get back to his all-pro form this year. Um, it's been a few years since he's really been a game-changing safety back there. I do think the defensive scheme is going to help a lot more, allow him to play um, further from the ball. Um, and as, especially um, the biggest thing for him is, I think, the addition of Javon Brisker, uh, because he's more comfortable, you know, closer to the line of scrimmage and allow Eddie Jackson to be more of a roaming, roaming free safety. I think that's going to be a good good for him. Um, less responsibility for him. Um, I really think if you had a slot corner, that'd be nice too. be uh, a really locked down slot corner as well, because Eddie Jackson did kind of cover the slot a lot, uh, which he was actually pretty good at. But I want to see him just roam in the middle of the field. So hopefully this the scheme change and the personnel changes will help him. I mentioned I like DeAndre Houston Carson. I think he's got a spot locked up given how he played last year and his special teams ability. Um, and then Dane Cruikshank as well, uh, another guy who has special teams experience and you know played pretty well on, uh, for the Titans when called upon. Um, so I think those four guys are locked in. If they do decide to keep a, a, a fifth safety, uh, maybe Elijah Hicks, the draft pick out of Cal, um, could surprise some people. Um, but he seems more like a practice squad guy to me. And then everyone after that is just death piece, just camp bodies, I believe. So it's really just a five-man competition there. Maybe they decide to keep five safeties, probably only, only keep four. Uh, but we'll see how that plays out. Linebackers, uh, Roquan Smith, obviously. I have him as the mic here. I, I think he might be actually playing Will. Uh, I think him and Nicholas Morrow are going to be um, kind of interchangeable at that Mike and Will spot. Um, I could probably, I'm just now realizing this, but I could probably put Nicholas Morrow as a starter spot locked up. Um, I do think it's he's clearly the, you know, the second best linebacker on this team. So those two spots are pretty locked in. Um, the interesting thing is going to come into play on that Sam linebacker position. They really don't have anyone with much experience um, on the roster there. Uh, Jack Sanborn is a guy I really liked out of Wisconsin as a linebacker. A uh, bigger guy is able to take on blocks a lot better than Roquan and, and Nicholas Morrow can. So I like him at that Sam linebacker position, but that's really anyone's anyone's job. Caleb Johnson can certainly win that. Noah Dawkins, uh, Joe Thomas, um, and those you know other guys as well. Any one of those guys could probably win that Sam linebacker position. Um, so that'll be interesting to watch. Not a hugely important position that come out of the you know, that's the Sam linebacker comes off the field on passing downs, but it is an, it is, you know, a position that they need to fill. Um, and it obviously you want someone better than, than what they have. So that might be a position where they look into maybe can um, other teams once they make some cuts to fill in that position. Um, if there's a cap casualty or something, um, but right now I do think Jack Sanborn, the rookie undrafted rookie out of Wisconsin, um, could surprise some people right there. And then lastly, we got the defensive line, uh, a position that has, um, at least on the edges, seems pretty good to me. You got um, you got Robert Quinn um, at, at one defensive end. Um, we don't really know what's going on, if he wants a trade or not, but he re reported to camp, and, he's gonna be, and according to polls, they haven't had any conversations about trading him. So right now, he's locked into one defensive end spot. Um, on the other side, you have Travis Gibson, um, who played really well last year, and Muhammad, Al-Kadeem Muhammad. Um, 
who is a, who has come over from the Colts. So he has obviously some familiarity with the defense that they're going to run. Uh, that's going to be an interesting camp battle. Um, I'm going to kind of go into more detail on that as well. Um, I like Gibson a lot. I think he has the upside to be a really good defensive end of this league. Muhammad's probably more of a safer play to start the year. Um, he's really he's good against the run, not as good of his pass rusher. Gibson's a good pass rusher and decent against the run, but Muhammad probably hasn't beat there. So it really kind of depends on what they want. I'm sure they'll be kind of interchangeable based on the who they're playing and the scheme that week on who they want to start. Uh, but obviously both those guys are locked into the roster. At defensive tackle, um, they don't have a, uh, a lot of talent here, and they don't have a lot of depth either. Uh, Justin Jones is kind of locked into that three technique. They they signed him after, um, oh, God, I'm blanking on his name right now. Um, you know, the, the defensive tackle from the uh, Bengals who failed his physical, Larry Ogunjobi, after he failed his physical, they signed Justin Jones. So he's not great, but I do think he's locked into that three technique spot. Um Mario Edwards is a guy who has, um, you know, in the Bears 3-4 scheme, he's playing more of a 5 technique. Uh, but I do think he has he could be a really good 3 technique, at least on passing downs. Uh, obvious passing downs put him in there to rush the passer. Uh, Sam Kamara played edge last year, but at 200 and almost 90 pounds, I think they're going to move him inside to that 3 technique spot. Um, at nose tackle, I think it's a combination between Angelo Blackson and Kairos Tonga. Um, uh, these last couple of weeks, while I haven't been doing podcasts, I have been watching a lot of of tape on I, every game of the Bears. And one the one guy that has probably impressed me the most from my relaunch is Angelo Blackson. I thought he played extremely well last year. Um, so I thought about even maybe putting him as the starter spot locked up. Um, but Tonga could could probably beat him out as well. But he is a player that I, I came away with way more impressed uh, on my rewatch than I did from just watching the 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 games last season um and i think he's going to be a valuable piece for them um i don't think he's a game changer by any means but i do think he's at least a solid starter who's not going to hurt you if he has to play um a ton of snaps this year after those guys after those you know four guys on the defensive at defensive tackle there really isn't a whole lot mike pennell is a good run stuffer but he's older and he hasn't been really that good the last couple of years uh, could be a good depth piece, but it'll be kind of an uphill battle for him to make the roster. And the other guys are just undrafted free agents from the last couple of years who are, are mostly cap bodies. Um, so overall, um, it's not a great roster, but I do think it has some uh, chance of surprising people. Um, I wouldn't have said that two days ago before they signed Riley Reef and Michael Schofield, uh, but that you know, baseline level of average play on the offensive line is really going to make it a lot easier for Justin Fields and company to to run their offense. Um, so that's just kind of a quick overview of their depth chart. We can start getting into the camp battles now, uh, but I just want to go kind of through step by step there. All right, so we'll start with the position everyone's going to be looking at offensive line, that right tackle spot with between Tevin Jenkins and Larry Borum. I did a bit uh, uh, a longer breakdown of the entire offensive line in my last podcast. So feel free to go and watch that. I think it's great. Um, watch that if you want a kind of a full breakdown. Uh, but I'll still go into a little bit of detail about them. Um, it's kind of a tale of two different uh, seasons for them. Tevin Jenkins um, didn't st- start the year on IR because uh, he had back surgery. So he didn't get his first start till like about week 13, I think. Um, and he got kind of thrust into the starting lineup against the Packers and had just an, a, a god awful game. Um, no matter how you slice it. It was a really tough matchup for him. But after that, he really kind of settled in and played actually extremely well down the stretch, which I don't think enough people are talking about. Um, And so the opposite with Larry Borum. Larry Borum got to start a little bit earlier. Um, His first two games were okay. Um, Pretty good. Um, You know, people will point point to his stats against uh, um, TJ Watt and uh, Nick Bosa and say he played amazing. He played okay. He played pretty good. there were some issues, but overall, for a rookie in his first couple of games, starting played pretty well. Uh, but after that, once teams had some tape on him, they started to tee off on him, and and he did not play well down the stretch. So again, kind of the two different uh, um, two different uh, seasons there for both guys. So Tevin Jenkins, if we look at him, um, his first fifty snaps, he had thirty seven pass block opportunities, gave up two sacks, seven total pressures. Um, 18.9% pressure rate and five penalties. That's obviously not good enough. So that was his first game against the Packers. Um, after that, his next 74 pass block opportunities, he gave up zero sacks, uh, only four total pressures uh, for a pressure rate of 5.4%, and 
and only two penalties. So less penalties and more snaps is always a good thing. Um, so he really kind of settled into his own um, and showed why he was uh, a second round pick um, last season. So I do think he he played extremely well down the stretch and has that inside job inside track for the starting right tackle job. Uh, Larry Borum, on the other hand, his first two games, like I said, played pretty well. 37 pass block opportunities. This is in true pass sets. So this is pass sets where there's no uh, play action, no chipping tight ends or or running backs. It's just a better indicator of how so- how someone plays individually. It takes out all the snaps where they don't have where they have help and everything like that, and just make looks at the snaps where they're just in one on one with their man. Um, so 37 pass block opportunities. His first two games gave up only one sack, two uh, total pressures for 5.4 percent pressure rate, only one penalty. Uh, so pretty good. After that, though, he had 134 pass block opportunities, gave up two sacks, 19 hurries, 24 total pressures for a pressure rate of 17.9% and three penalties. Um, so again, you always like to see players getting better as they play more. Um, I'm not saying this is, you know, a death sentence for Larry Borm. Progression's not always linear, so he can use, you know, what he learned in those last seven games last year to certainly get better. Um, but I think it does show kind of the difference in talent between Tevin Jenkins and Larry Borm. Um, on how it just took one game for Tevin Jenkins to kind of adjust to the speed of NFL, and he started putting together a pretty good year. All right, so that was what the stats say. Let's go to the film. So I put together some some clips uh, from their games last season. This particular one I like to use because it actually it shows Tevin Jenkins and Larry Borum on the same play, uh, blocking the the same you know deep defenders, um, and it just goes to show. Um, how much smoother and cleaner Tevin Jenkins uh, was down the stretch uh, than Larry Borum. So if we play this, you can see obviously Tevin Jenkins on the left side um, over here. And you got Larry Borum on the right side over there. So if we play this, oops, me do that again play this and you can see their kick slides you can see just they're in from the way they're set up here you have Larry Borm who's way back on his heels not in a good position to pass block um, whereas you have um, Tevin Jenkins who has really strong punch good wide base not over out on his toes but also not back on his heels you can see the center of gravity for for Larry Borm here is is, is not good you put it right down the center there more of his weight's kind of on his heels. He's not really in a good position to to absorb that block or get that uh, a good punch on that on Kenny Willickis, the defensive end he's going up against there. Um, so just that's just kind of how it starts. If we play this a little bit more, you can see how uh, Kenny Willickis, the defensive end here against Larry Borum, gets his hand into his chest, whereas Tevin Jenkins has that nice long arm, keeping his defender away from his body, um, just in a much better position to uh, to block his man. You can also see just their feet. Um, Jenkins has a nice wide base, uh, not oversetting or anything like that, whereas you have Larry Borum, who's way knocked off balance because he wasn't in a good position because of his pass set. Again, he was back on his heels. He was not in a good uh, position to to anchor and position to, to control his man, whereas Tevin Jenkins... Um, was in a much better position and it resulted in a much more uh clean block uh and clean play from him so if you play this uh uh, uh Borm gets knocked back into the quarterback um, and disrupts the play so that's just one example of why i think tevin jenkins is going to win that right tackle spot over layer Borm. Um, I have a few more examples so this next play is just of uh, tevin jenkins Larry Borm's not in on this play here but if we just look at Tevin Jenkins on the left side, this is probably one of my favorite reps from Tevin Jenkins all last year. Um, it's just, a, a to me, just a perfect pass uh, pass set from him. Um, so this is, again, going against the Vikings, but it's a different game. Uh, this is the Week 15 game, I believe, whereas the other one was the Week 18 game. Uh, but again, you have Tevin Jenkins on the left-hand side. He's going to go up against the defensive end, and you can see really nice 45-degree kick slide. He gets his hands in a, in a nice position here. This is something that I'm going to highlight a little bit later, so I want to point it out here. Um, but he has his hands up in position to um, to block his guy, um, really in a ready position. Nice wide base, um, doing uh, just a kind of a perfect kick slide. And then what he does 
as he gets his hands on his guy. A really nice strong punch. Let me run this a little bit farther. And he gets his, as you can see, he gets his hands underneath the shoulder pads. Come on. Underneath the shoulder pads. Um, and is able to, con because of that hand placement, um, he's able to control his guy, and his guy is not able to get around him. Um, he really did uh, get a lot better with his hands as the year went on. Um, you can see here, once he gets his hands on him, he's got nice strong hands. The defensive end can't escape. Uh, if we look at a play from um, this first game against the Packers, you can see kind of the difference here. And I'm not going to draw on this play, um, so I'll just leave it like this. But you can see, again, he's on the left-hand side here. And I just want you to watch his arms on how and how different that was from early in the year until late in the year. So this was his very first game. It's actually one of his first snaps. And you can see how he has his right right from the get-go. He has his arms at his side, not really in a ready position. And he keeps them there throughout the entire time. Um, so even a couple steps later, he has his arms still by his side. And because of that, he's just not able to get his arms on his on the defender to control him in a meaningful way. Um, so he he, you can see right there, um, I believe that's Rashawn Gary, one of the, uh, the Packers defensive end, whoever that is, um, is able to get his arms into the chest of Tevin Jenkins and control him rather than vice versa. Um, and it's going to result in um, Jenkins resorting to, to holding and, and giving up a sack of, of, uh, uh, for Justin Fields. And I said this in the last one as well, but Tevin Jenkins needs to learn if you're going to hold your guy, your defense, your guy, and it's, you're going to be, you're an offensive lineman, you're going to hold from time to time. Make sure your quarterback doesn't get hit. That's the one of the things I hate the most. You, you get the holding penalty and you get Justin Fields killed. Um, so that's not a good combination. But that, again, this was from early in the year. The reason I'm showing this, I just want to show you the growth um, in his technique. You know, having his arms at his side like that. It's something that he obviously saw um, coaches told him. Um, and he worked on as the year went on and got much better. And, it, and that was a big reason why those stats um, got much better. Um, oops. Uh, from that first 50 snaps, this is one of those first 50 snaps to his next 110 snaps. Um, why he got so much better at, at, uh, in terms of giving up pressures and giving up sacks. Um, and it just goes to show how his coachability um, stands out and his talent level um, as a second round pick. All right, so on to Larry Borum. Um, I do want to say that while I think Tevin Jenkins is going to win that right tackle spot, uh, I do think Larry Borum could be a, a pretty serviceable swing tackle or even potentially moved inside to guard. Um, but he does have some things he needs to work on. Um, and I talked about this in depth in the offensive line breakdown. This is just one ex one more example, and I'll get in, I promise I'll get into something that Larry Borum does well. Uh, but we saw on the, on the last one when I was talking about Larry Borum how he was way back on his heels. Um, this is actually the opposite. So. Um, on this particular play, he's way out over his toes. He's not sitting in that chair um, that you want to see uh, in your kick slide. So if we play this. Oh. Here we go. So again, uh, right tackle here. You can see how far out over his toes he is. Um, and he, when he reaches out, because he's so far out of his toes, the defensive end, in this case Kenny Willikis, is able to easily swat his hands away and get, a, get him and beat him around the edge. Um, so we watch that again. So you can see how far out over his toes he gets. It's not super egregious here. There you go. That's a good um, stunt point right there. You can see kind of how his, his center of gravity is now way out over his toes. Where on the last play, his center of gravity was way back on his heels. He needs to even that, that out, uh, make sure that his, his center of gravity um, is set um, not too far back, not too far forward. Um, and then because and because of that again, you can just see the defender is easy easily able to swat away his hands and beat him around the edge. All right, so this next uh, rep from Larry Borum is actually a set that I really like. Uh, this is against the Giants uh, earlier on in the year. Um, so the uh, reps against Kenny Willickis were late in the year. This was about the middle of the year. Um, this is a, an example of a jump set from Larry Borum. So a jump set is where you attack the defensive end on your second step rather than your third step. So you can see the difference between the rep from Larry Borum and the rep from Jason Peters. Uh, neither is incorrect. It's just a different way to, to approach pass blocking. But you'll see Jason Peters is a lot later to um, attack his defender, whereas uh, Larry Borum on his second step um, attacks um, the defensive end. So you can see, you play this. Come on, there we go. 
you can see how he attacks him. Well, uh, on that second step, um, it's called a jump set again. So Larabar is able to get into his man a lot quicker than Jason Peters did on the other side. Um, again, neither one is incorrect or better than the other. It's just uh, uh, based on um, on the scheme and the defender you're going up against. A lot of times you do a jump set if there's a quick pass because uh, you want to make sure that you get your hands on the defender so they can't get their hands in the passing lane. Uh, but not all the time. Uh, but that's uh, most of the, usually when you would want to do a jump set. But you can see Larry Barham here. Um, he's not on his heels. He's not on his toes. He has a good um, center of gravity. He's able, and because of that, he's able. His punch lands a lot smoother, a lot easier, um, and is able to get his hands on his guy um, and control him a lot better um, at the point of attack than he did on those last couple um, examples that I have. So in this particular rep, again, he gets his hand on him, and it's just a great rep from Larry Borum. Uh, probably one of his better reps on the year. Um, and it does show that he has potential and he has played well at in the at the NFL level. Um, he just needs to do it on a more consistent basis. And in, when it comes to Larry Borum versus Tevin Jenkins, I thought after that first game, Tevin Jenkins did, did things much more consistently and much smoother um, than Larry Borum did over the course of the year. Uh, but I don't want to knock Larry Borum too much. Uh, I'm just using this juxtaposition to, to show why I think Jenkins should be starting. But I do think Larry Borum... Could be a very good swing tackle, tackle as I mentioned. Um, I also am very intrigued on, with him on the inside, playing at, at guard. Um, you know, Michael Schofield is only on a one-year contract. Cody White here is most likely going to get cut after this year, um, so they're going to need, need a guard. And I'd really want to see him on the inside. I think he does a lot better with power than he does with speed, um, going up against power than he does going up against speed. Um, and I do think, um, and you could just see right here from the jump set, I think he's better when he's able to attack his guys a little bit earlier. Uh, rather than let them get into his body. Um, so I think that would make him a very good and very serviceable, serviceable guard moving forward. Uh, but I, this year, with the, how the roster is set up, I think he'd be a perfect swing tackle, uh, just in case Jenkins gets hurt or Riley Reef gets hurt. All right, so next I want to talk about the probably the next biggest competition for the Bears. Uh, it's the position that mo most Bears fans are going to be interested in, and that's the wide receiver position. As I mentioned when we were talking about the depth chart, those top three guys are pretty much locked in. John Mooney, um, uh, Bayless Jones, and Byron Pringle. Those top three guys. Uh, but that wide, re wide receiver four spot is going to be playing a lot for the Bears, um, either due to injuries or just you know giving guys breathers. Um, so it's an important position. Um, they need someone to kind of step up in that role. Um, when I was showing the depth chart, I, I mentioned I think Equinemia St. Brown is most likely going to be that fourth guy, or at least is a lock to make the roster. Uh, but Nikhil Harry and uh, Dante Pettis are also going to be competing for those spots. Maybe Tajay Sharp and some other guys. But those are, those three guys, I think, are the main guys that are are going to be competing for that spot. Uh, so because of that, I took a look at the first took a look at their stats. So I have a wide receiver comparison here. Um, it just their stats for for their entire their entire career. Um, overall, they had pretty much the same amount of receiving snaps. Uh, Equinemius St. Brown has been hurt a lot. Um, uh, and, uh, but so he has a little bit less, but for the most part, they're, they're pretty similar. Um, you can see on the, the counting stats, so total targets, total receptions, total yards, uh, Nikia Harry kind of stands out there, uh, just because I think he's had more opportunities there. Uh, but when you get into the actual, you know, um, the per reception stats and the catch percentage and the yards per reception, yards per target, um, that's where I think Equinemia St. Brown and Dante Pettis kind of pull away, um. When watching Equinemius St. Brown, one of the things that impressed me the most is his ability after the catch. Um, I didn't really think of him that way uh, when the when the Bears signed him, uh, but he was actually pretty good after the catch and actually showed some explosiveness. So you can see from that 6.3 yards per after catch per reception uh, that he is uh, pretty good in that regard. Whereas Nakia Harry, even though in college he did show some yards after catch ability, really hasn't been a threat at the NFL level with the ball in his hands. And I think that's just uh, an athleticism issue. Uh, with Nakira, he doesn't have that that wiggle, that that extra gear. Not to say, to say that Echo Name St. Brown is is a burner with with four three speed. He's not. Uh, but when you just watch them play, um, you can see just how they move differently. Uh, Echo Name St. Brown a little bit more fluid, whereas Nakira Harry is a little bit more rigid, and I think that shows up in that yards after catch ability. Um, yards after catch per reception, you know, Echo Name St. Brown and Dante Pettis, they were they're catching balls um, a little bit more downfield. Um, or at least Equinemius St. Brown is, as you can see from his average depth of target uh, of 13 yards, whereas Harry and Pettis are, you know, around 10 yards of, of their average depth of target. Um, and then that bottom 
um, stat there, it's just the special team snaps. That just shows you how, um, you know, how much these guys have contributed on special teams. And any teams wide receiver for four, five, six, those guys are going to have to play on special teams. Economia St. Brown has done that in the past. Um, I, and I also think he's a, just a better receiver than, than Nikhil Harry, at least. Uh, Dante Pettis is probably the best route runner of all these guys. He's a little bit smaller stature. Brown and Nikhil Harry are going to be, you know, competing for that X position, um, uh, wide receiver uh, position. Dante Pettis is going to be more of that slot guy. Uh, but then when it comes to the special team snaps, regardless of what wide receiver position they're playing, they're going to have to play on special teams. Eckerdine St. Brown has done that. Pettis and Harry really have not. Um, so I don't know. I can't see a scenario where they keep both Harry and Pettis unless they both, you know, show out on special teams in preseason. Um, but I think they're going to, you know, take the best receiver out of this bunch and then fill out the rest of their roster with guys who can play on special teams. Okay, again, so that's the stats. Uh, but what does the tape say? So what I, first guy we're going to look at is Equinemia St. Brown. I mentioned he's probably my favorite, at least of the X guys, St. Brown and Harry. Um, and I do think he's a better wide receiver than people give him credit for. I, I've seen a lot of people write off Equinemia St. Brown um, as, as, as a depth piece at best. So a lot of people saying he might not even make, make the roster. Um, I do think he's a lock to make the roster for a variety of reasons, mostly being the familiar, familiarity with the with the offense and his special teams ability. But I think he's been underrated as a receiver as well. Um, this is a guy a lot of people remember him from his Notre Dame days, who who played really well at Notre Dame. A lot of people hate him for that because he went to Notre Dame, and I think that's what part of this stems from. Uh, but here he is at he's at the bottom of the screen here, um, and you can see he's just going to run a slant here. Um, it's going to be a little bit difficult to see because this is going to be in the way. Um, but you can see how he uh, initially goes to the outside before slanting over the middle. And you can see the defender there, how, how he turns around the defender. That's not something you see very often from a young wide receiver, um, or at least um, against a veteran cornerback. Um, so he's able to create that separation with his route running. This is a guy who's 6'5", 210 pounds, so he's not a small guy. So his ability to to turn around a cornerback like that and win with his route running rather than winning with his side size, I think is very impressive. And the rest of this play, he also shows off some run after the catch ability. You know, he's not easy to bring down. He usually doesn't get caught um, with that from that first guy. Um, so I think, you know, this is just one example, and I have a few more as well. Uh, but I think that's a very good route from Ekonia St. Brown and something that the Packers ran a lot of slants, uh, mostly with Devontae Adams. But I think Ekonia St. Brown showed there that he can um, run those slants and, and get those easy yardage. So there's been a lot of talk this offseason about the Bears and the X wide receiver position. Um, a lot of people, you know, think you need a guy who's 6'3", six, 6'4", six, six, to play that X position. Um, and that's not the case. Um, Ekonia St. Brown... It, you know, for reference, is 6'5", and he is a bigger wide receiver. Uh, but it's not the size is not the determining factor of an X wide receiver to me. If you want to be an X wide receiver, you need to do two things. You need to be able to beat press coverage, and you need to be able to stretch the field vertically. Now, obviously, you want that. It would be really nice to have a guy who's 6'3", 6'4", 6'5", who can do that. There's not that many guys who exist. So, you know, you, you don't have to be that it's not size that determines an XY receiver, it's the ability. Um, and in this instance's ability, um, Equinemia St. Brown shows the ability to beat press coverage. Um, so he is going up against his man here. This time he's at the top of the screen. Um, so he's going to face some, some press coverage and he's going to use his size um, and his skill to beat, beat his man and he's going to run a dig route over the middle. So again, faces press coverage, really doesn't have any issue with that. And that's something he showed consistently. You know, he doesn't have a lot of snaps to look at, only 500 or so. Uh, but whenever he was tasked with beating press coverage, he rarely, you know, was disrupted and thrown off his route by physical uh, physical cornerbacks at the line of scrimmage. Um, so he also runs a pretty good route here as well, too. So not only does he beat the press, he uses his hands well, he also does a little bit of a head fake. Uh, before cutting over the middle on that dig route. Uh, so again, just another kind of thing he brings to the table is a guy who can beat press. Darnell Mooney, I love Darnell Mooney. I think he's a great wide receiver. He struggles with press from time to time. Uh, uh, Bayless Jones is, you know, probably going to struggle to press um, in the at the NFL level. Uh, they need a guy who can, you know, beat press coverage and beat man coverage. 
and I can move some around in a small sample size. Um, has shown you can do that, not necessarily consistently. Consistently, I don't think Equinemius St. Brown is going to be a game-changing wide receiver for the Bears, uh, but I do think he he is that best fourth option that the Bears have on the roster currently. So just another uh, couple more plays on Equinemius St. Brown. Uh, so this is an example uh, of his route running ability that I think is underrated by by most uh, NFL fans and, and Bears fans as well. Um, but here he is in the slot over here. And what he's going to do is he's going to run, run a double move. So he's going to run a fake out and then go up the seam. Um, and you can see how we, the reason I like this play is how he gets his whole body into the route. Um, he really sells this, that double move with his head um, and how he turns around to the ball. And you'll see that when I, when I play it in a second. Um, so you'll see, watch him in the slot there. So he's going to run the out route, and you can see how he sells that fake. Um, and by doing so, that brings that slot corner up um, to jump the route. And obviously, the, the pump fake from Aaron Rodgers also helps. Uh, but once they he draws that slot cornerback up, he's going to turn up field. Um, a really nice route by Equinemi St. Brown here. And then I really like this play as well because you get that run after the catch ability. Um, you know, he's not a burner by any means because he does get caught from behind here. Uh, but the way he moves, he's very smooth with his movements. Um, and he's probably a 4-5 guy, uh, but he moves a little bit differently than a lot of 4-5 guys. Um, and his this play, um, you know, shows that, how how he's able to turn a, a, a pretty good 20-yard gain into a 50-yard gain pretty easily. And then one last play for Ekene St. Brown, and I wanted to show this play uh, because, um, well, one, it's a pretty impressive play by Ekene St. Brown, but I also wanted to show how it's another example of how uh, the Bears can utilize these wide receivers who have really good run after catch ability in their offense. So this play is obviously run with Ekene St. Brown on the Packers, but this play could easily be run by Valus Jones it, um, in their in the Luke Getze's scheme. Uh, it could be run by Darnell Mooney, Byron Pringle, any of these, Nikhil Harry even was well, um, Dante Pettis, any of these guys can run this play uh, because it's a very good example of how they get the ball into their playmaker playmakers' hands and allow them to create um, with the ball in their hands. Um, so this is going to be a, a play action um, end around. So um, play action is going to go this way. Um, and Eponema St. Brown is going to get the end around uh, on the pitch from Rodgers. Um, he's going to turn that into, into a decent uh, chunk here um, to get that inside the five. Uh, but again, this is, could be run easily with Bayless Jones or any other wide receiver that the Bears have this year. Um, so they're going to run fake duo. And if you want to learn what duo is, I did a uh, uh, Luke Getzey offensive line breakdown, run scheme breakdown, so you can uh, view that to kind of see what that is. But basically, they're running a power run scheme or fake power run scheme to the right. Um, and that's another thing I wanted to bring up. The Bears are going to be obviously using an outside zone scheme. The Packers use an outside zone scheme as well. But no matter how what what you run as your main scheme, or if you do majority outside zone or majority inside zone, um, you're going to run some power concepts as well. And that's what this is. Um, so it's a fake power scheme, a uh, fake power run uh, with that end around built into to, to uh, Equinemius St. Brown. So if you see this, and the reason I wanted to highlight this is because it shows off some really good uh, run after the catch ability. Obviously, this isn't a, uh, a catch. It's a, it's a straight up end around. Uh, but it does show his ability to make people miss in the open field. Um, so you guys have some good block. His blockers do, do a very good job. Uh, but he is here one on one with this safety. Um, so, you know, this could be just, you know, a four or five yard gain. Uh, but instead, uh, St. Brown actually shows some really nice wiggle and juke ability to make that guy miss um, and get that inside the 10 uh, and to set up a first down and a first and goal for the Packers. All right. So I talked way too much about economy of St. Brown. So let's move on. Uh, I'm going to talk now about Nikhil Harry. Um, so I do think Nikhil Harry and Equinemi St. Brown are competing for that X wide receiver position. Um, I, I, with St. Brown's uh, familiar with the offense and special teams ability, I do think he has the leg up. Uh, but the Bears did trade a seventh round pick for Nikia Harry. Yeah, it's a future seventh round pick. It's not a huge draft capital that they gave up to get him, but it is still an investment that they, they made into him. They obviously see something that they can get out of him um, and hope, you know, take a chance on a former first round pick and hope he. He, uh, he gets to where the Patriots thought he would be when they drafted him. 
Um, so I do think Ekonami St. Brown is a better receiver and, and, and has a leg up. But Perry did show some flashes uh, from time to time. Um, um, and this is just one example. A lot of his production, you know, when I showed it the wide receiver stats, he had more receptions and targets and everything. It was it was a lot of uh, 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 manufactured touches, manufactured um, uh, they were uh, manufactured touches. They were clearly trying to get their first round pick involved in their offense. Um, so I tried to avoid those and just kind of find some routes where he he you know ran a good route or made someone miss or something like that. Um, and this is an example of that. So here he is at the bottom of the screen. And he's going to run uh, just a slant, a deep slant over the middle. And he's actually going to take a pretty big hit uh, from the safety. But I really like how he sold this route. Um, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't get his head into that slant like like Equinemia St. Brown did. Uh, but he does make a good, quick cut. Um, and uh, the safety the, uh, cornerback here is not able to keep up. So if we play this here. You can see how he he, he pushes upfield uh, pretty quickly, and then he gets that quick cut in there um, to go over the middle, and, and again takes a big hit from the safety there um, and holds onto the ball. So I thought that was a very good route from him. He didn't show this consistently. A lot of the, his routes are very rounded, um, so he's not getting open with his route running, um, and he's not creating a lot of separation. Here is a good good example of when he did it. He just didn't do it consistently enough. Um, in, even in college, his best plays were, were contested catches uh, where he's making a, a leaping grab over a defender. Um, and as we know, as we've learned over the years, um, that's just not a good, that does not translate always to the pros or usually does not translate to the pros. Um, it's funny that the Bears acquired Nikhil Harry because um, I do watch a lot, I do, I'm very into the NFL draft and I watch a lot of NFL draft videos. And when Nikhil Harris, Harry was coming out, he was a player that I really liked because he he caught those passes and made those ridiculous catches, uh, contested catches. Yeah, he might not have been creating a lot of separation at the NFL level, uh, but he was making those catches, and I thought that would be something that translates. Um, but Nikhil Harry is one of the reasons why I changed how I scout wide receivers when it comes to NFL draft uh, because those that contested catch ability might look nice in college, but it just doesn't translate to the pros always. Um, I want to find a guy who can, you know, is maybe a better route runner and creates more separation uh, because that's more easily translatable to the pros. Um, that being said, as I, as you've seen here, Miguel Harry did show some flashes of, of decent route running ability. Um, and he was a former first round pick for a reason. Maybe he was overdrafted that year, uh, but he still has the talent of a, you know, top, a top pick, top first, second, third round pick at, at the very least. Um, so there might be something there. I again, just like Economy St. Brown, and just like most of the guys we're, we're talking about uh, today, not going to be a game changer. Not going to put the Bears over the top. Uh, but if they can find a solid depth piece and a nice um, X wide receiver, even an average X wide receiver for a future seventh round pick, um, that's a win in my book. So I talked about the contested catchability with Nikhil Harry. Um, he is a guy who's who's very physical, and he needs to be physical in order to win that. You know, that slant route that I showed, that's not how he consistently wins. He's usually going to win with more, uh, with beating press uh, and more physical at the, either at the line of scrimmage or at the stem of his route. Um, here he's at the top of the screen, um, and he's, you can see how, how physical he gets with his defender to kind of box out um, and create a cat uh, and, and catch the touchdown here. And I do think that's a way that the Bears could use him um, in the red zone on these, when the windows get a little bit smaller, um, you need a guy who could be more physical than the, the defender and make those contested catches. So I do think this is an area where they could utilize Nikhil Harry. So again, he's at the top of the screen here. So you can see, come on. So you can see how he pushes away. You might be able to call that pass interference. Um, it wasn't called on the field, so I'm not, I'm certainly not going to call it from my desk, uh, but you can see how he, cre he, you know, creates that separation with physicality rather than route running. Uh, that's not going to work all the time, uh, but it is an area that the Bears could use him. You know, Darnell Mooney is not a great contested catch receiver. Um, Valus Jones is undersized. Most likely he's not going to be a great contested catch receiver. Even Cole Komet, despite being bigger, hasn't shown at the NFL level that he can be a great contested catch wide receiver. Um, so having a guy like this in the red zone uh, could certainly be useful Useful for them. Another idea that that's been floating around t uh, Twitter a lot with Nikia Harry is moving him to tight end. And it's an idea that I really like. Um, I mentioned, you know, earlier when I was going through the depth chart that the bears don't really have a U tight end. 
Um, I like James O'Shaughnessy, but he's not a you know, game changer by any means. So I think moving him to that U tight end and allowing him to do stuff like this, uh, get him matched up with linebackers instead of, of cornerbacks, um, where he can probably create a little bit more separation is most likely how he's going to succeed in the NFL if he is going to succeed at all. Um, so I do like that idea a lot. And this is kind of an example of how they could use him in, in that role. So the next guy I'm going to be looking at at the wide receiver position uh, when I go to trade and camp on Saturday is Dante Pettis. And Dante Pettis is another guy I really liked coming out of college a few years ago. He never really caught on in San Francisco. Uh, he moved on to the Giants. Um, didn't really catch on there either. Uh, but he has shown flashes throughout his career, more than flashes. You know, he has um, consistently gone open throughout his career. Um, and he does it differently than both at Gwinnie Miss St. Brown and... Um, and Nikhil Harry. He's a much better route runner than both of them. Um, I liked Equinemi St. Brown as a route runner for a guy who's 6'5", um, but he's not a great route runner. Equinemi, um, sorry, uh, Dante Pettis, also not a great route runner, but he's a very, very good route runner. Um, he struggles more with physicality, whereas Equinemi St. Brown and Nikhil Harry don't as much, so it's a very different receiver. St. Brown, Harry, they're going to be competing at the X spot. Dante Pettis is going to be that slot receiver, maybe a Z wide receiver, um, but he's going to be uh, um, more on the inside rather than on the outside. Uh, but I have a couple plays here that you'll see uh, that just showcase his route running ability. Um, you, he moves a lot smoother than the last two guys we saw. He moves a lot more like uh, like Darnell Mooney um, does. You can see just from his movement skills um, that he's different. Um, so this is a great example of, of a route he ran um, against the Vikings. Don't know why my video is not working. But you can see how he sets up his guy and creates a lot more separation than both Equinemius St. Brown and Akil Harry. Um, he's able to do that pretty consistently, whereas the other two guys might show flashes from time to time, um, but not as consistent as Dante Pettis. This is a, a, another good example of his route running ability. So he's actually got a guy up on his face, um, and there are multiple different ways you could beat press coverage. Um, we saw it with, Harry, uh, with St. Brown. He beat it with his physicality and his size. Uh, Dante Pettis here is facing some press coverage, press coverage, but he beats it with his quickness and his lateral agility. You can see, uh, even though he has a guy right in his face, the defender actually never gets a hand on him to press him uh, because he's so quick um, and, and shifty at the line of scrimmage. So you can see the defender never gets a hand on him. And right there, you can see how he sell. This is what I was talking about earlier with Economia St. Brown and something that Nikhil Harry needs to work on. Um, you can see how he, look at his eyes. He's looking back over here, and he's really selling that route and setting this cornerback up uh, for and allowing him to break out um, to the outside and get wide open on this play. So this is one of my favorite routes of his. Uh, but again, it all starts with how he sells that route. It's not only with his footwork, but it's all, he gets his whole body into it um, and is able to get open because of that. And I don't know why my player's not working. But let's just watch that whole thing without stopping it. You can see how he beats press there, gets his whole head into the route, and gets wide open here for, for a pretty uh, decent chunk, uh, decent game. Uh, this is another one. This is in the, in the end zone. Again, he's facing... Press coverage, uh, but is able to beat it now with physicality, but with his quickness um, um, at the line of scrimmage. The next position, position I'm going to talk about is not so much a camp battle because I think it's pretty much set, but it's a guy I'm looking forward to seeing, and that's James O'Shaughnessy, uh, the tight end, uh, the U tight end that the the only U tight end really on the roster for the Bears. Um, we know the Bears based on the Luke Getzey scheme and where he's coming from. We know that they're going to want to use multiple tight ends. You have Cole Komet as one of them. Who's going to step up as that next tight end? More of that receiving tight end um, who can get open, uh, create separation through his routes. Maybe he's not a great blocker, uh, but someone who can you know threaten the seam and, and, and make sure that the Bears have a, another target there out on the field, another mismatch. Um, and that, the, that guy's James O'Shaughnessy. He's a guy I've really liked watching him. Again, you know, not a game changer, but I think he's a little bit better than what people think he's going to be. Um, and he really um, impressed me with his route running ability um, and the way he can threaten the scene. So I have some some videos of him as well. So here he's lined up right here. Um, and he's going to run um, a crosser. So he's going to beat the press and run over the middle, run around, something like that. Uh, but you can see how he how he is, you know, getting pressed by this 
by this corner, but he's able to beat that. Um, and you can see also how, again, I've been talking a lot about getting your whole body into routes and really selling your, your routes and your breaks. And this is a very good example of that. So fakes to the outside, cuts to the inside, starts getting upfield, and how he sells that whole route with his, with his body and with his head at first glance into the outside before breaking to the inside and creating separation when he has a cornerback on him. Um, so um, that isn't you know on a linebacker, that's on a guy who's much faster than him, um, and he's still able to create separation and get open and get a good, uh, pretty decent gain on the catch. So we can watch that again, full speed. Um, I'd like to see him, you know, he does have a cornerback on him, make that guy miss or, you know, get some more extra yards after the catch. Uh, but that's a good example of of what he can bring to this offense. Um, so another play from James O'Shaughnessy that I really liked. Um, so he's lined up here in the slot. So he's not really lined up in line as a tight end. He's lined up as more of a receiver. Um, and that's exactly how uh, he'll be used um, or or one of the ways he, he'll be used, I should say, in the, Bear, um, in the Bears offense. He's not a, that traditional Y tight end. He's a U tight end, a mismatch guy um, who might line up in the backfield. Um, he's not going to be lining up on the line of scrimmage in line a lot, uh, but you could split him out wide. You can um, put him next to the Y tight end, um, and this is just one way that that he could be used. But this is a really good route. He's going to run a corner route here, um, so just go up and and go to the corner. Uh, but again, this is another example of how he fakes to the inside. Uh, before cutting to the outside, he's lined up against a linebacker here, whereas on the last play, he's lined up as um, against a cornerback. Uh, but you can see, you know, it, it just allows him to get even more open because this linebacker is not used to covering a guy who can run routes uh, like O'Shaughnessy can. Uh, but again, he's going to run a corner route here. Let's play that. And then right. There, you can see how he glances uh, to the inside, uh, which causes the linebacker to look back uh, before breaking to the corner um, and getting a pretty easy reception uh, for a big game there. So let's watch that again, just full speed. You can see how he glances uh, to the inside, uh, sells it with his with his head, and his, he takes a step to the inside, uh, but really selling it with his entire body before breaking out into the corner um, and, getting, and catching the ball in front of the safety there. Um, so I think that's just a really good route, a really good example of how he could use it. And that's why his route running ability at his size, you know, he's 245, which is undersized for a tight end, but still pretty effing big. Um, so he's a guy I'm really excited to watch during during training camp. I know he's older. He's, you know, 30 years old, uh, but he's had injuries over the course of, the, of his career. Um, I don't think he's really been given a fair chance to be that receiving tight end in an offense, especially an offense like the Bears that's designed to have to be run with two tight ends. Um, running a lot of play action, um, I think he's a guy who can who can really thrive in this. One other thing I like about James O'Shaughnessy is his ability to threaten up the seam. Um, so that's um, up the middle of the field. Either you know if it's against a cover two over the middle, if it's a cover three down the seam. There, let me redraw that. Um, so yeah, against cover two, go over the middle. Um, against cover three, you're running more up the, the hash marks there. Uh, but his ability to throw the seed really showed out many times uh, when watching him. So this is one, wasn't something that he did only one time. This is something that he, did, that he did consistently. And that's also a point I want to bring up. Any, you know, things I'm showing here is not something that I saw someone do one time. I had someone mention that to me on Twitter that I just, you know, pick one um, video and, that, that, and, and use that one video evidence to, to form an opinion about guys and, and you know, they push a narrative. Anything that I show is I've seen that from that player at least a couple times. Uh, and I'll mention that I, I'll say if they don't do something consistently, I'll mention that. Um, but this uh, is something that James O'Shaughnessy did consistently um, with the Jaguars. And that's that's uh, thread of the seam there. So again, here you'll see that he, as I mentioned, he's going to be more of a U tight end for the Bears. The Bears will be running a lot of two tight end sets. Um, he won't be lining up on the line of scrimmage a lot. Uh, but that's exactly where he is here. Um, and that's another example of how he, he was really used incorrectly uh, by the Jaguars. Um, I know that's probably a broken record to Jaguars fans using players incorrectly. But um, but that's not really going to be how he's how he is used with the Bears as an inline blocking tight end. Uh, but 
how he's lined up to start the play doesn't affect you know his ability to threaten the seam. He can start out in the backfield. He can start as a slot receiver and still threaten the seam. So again, he's going to run over the middle. The the Vikings are going to be running a pretty standard cover two. Um, so you have your two deep safeties. This guy's right here. He's going to rotate and come back here. And then you have your middle linebacker, who I'm not sure which one of these ends up being the mic, but he's going to be covering the you know, the middle of the field here. Um, in the camp Tampa two, you have your cornerbacks here, and then you'll have two guys in zone right there. And then, um, so not a great diagram there. This guy should be more about here, but you get the point. So we can play this now, and you'll see how he makes uh, a pretty a pretty nice catch. Um, so that that uh, middle linebacker is going to run with him a little bit because that's his his zone. Uh, but he makes a great contested catch over his shoulder. Now, over the middle of the field, takes a pretty big hit and holds on to the ball. Um, we can kind of see that from an alternate angle. Uh, this is the same exact play, um, just an alternate angle, so you can see the reception a little bit better. Um, you see, number 50 is going to run with him, but he's able to make a nice catch. Um, again, take a big hit, but still hold on to the ball. Uh, and that's something he did consistently for the Jaguars, is throwing that scene. All right, that's enough of the offense. Let's move on to the defense, where I think there are actually a lot of uh, intriguing training camp battles. I know the focus is going to be on the offense, obviously, and how Justin Fields looks and everything, and the wide receivers and the offensive line. But I'm actually really excited to see how the defense kind of shakes out. Uh, so we're going to start close to the line of scrimmage. We're going to start with the with the edge players. Obviously, Robert Quinn, if he's you know um, not traded, uh, he's going to be locking down one of the starting positions um, coming off of, uh, his probably best year of his career. Um, breaking the Bears' um, single-season sack record. Uh, but the other side is going to come down to Travis Gibson, returning Bear, or al Qadim Muhammad, a player who's familiar with the system coming over from, from Indianapolis and working with uh, Matt Eberflus, um over there. So uh, this is a position where I think there's a clear, better player here, uh, and that's Travis Gibson to me. Um, I, I think he's, he's a much better pass rusher, and he's maybe just a slightly worse run defender. Uh, so I think, and he's younger, uh, higher upside. So I think, you know, if it were up to me, he would be the starter. But um, it really comes down to how much this team values a player who's who understands the scheme um, and has um, has played in that scheme before. Um, another interesting thing with with uh, with Travis Gibson and uh, Muhammad in this um, comparison is one player Gibson played, you know, uh, as kind of that third rusher last year. Um, he was kind of coming off the bench, whereas Muhammad was a starter for the Colts. So Muhammad played a lot more snaps than Gibson did. Um, and you always have to worry about, and Gibson played extremely well, but you always have to worry about a player going from that part-time role, especially as a pass rusher, and seeing if they can hold up that level of play as a full-time starter. Um, you know, you don't want to see them breaking down as the, as the year goes on. Are they able to create the same pressure rate um, if they're playing every snap and they might be, you know, a little bit gassed, can they do it in the fourth quarter after playing 50 snaps before then? Um, so that's something I am not con not concerned about Travis Gibson, but it's something he has to prove. Um, for any Bears fans who are 30 or older, uh, like I am, you probably remember Mark Anderson, who had a great rookie, rookie year um, with 12 or so sacks, um, in put it into the starting lineup uh, the next couple of years and never really got back to that level. And it's because he was a great situational pass rusher. Um, well, there's a variety of reasons for that, but one of them was he was a great situational pass rusher, not so great when asked to play a full-time role. Um, so I think Gibson is better suited to play that full-time role, uh, but it'll be interesting to see that that camp competition and who comes out on top. Again, if it were up to me, it'd be Travis Gibson, but Muhammad is a nice player in his own right um, and has a lot to bring to the table. So if we look at the stats, um, I got all, most of these stats from PFF and Pro Football Reference. Um, you can see at the top there the pass rush snaps. 229 for Gibson as opposed to 457 for Muhammad. So obviously a lot more uh, tape to go on. Uh, but if you look at the rush grade, it's no question that Gibson is a better pass rusher. And if you look at the tape, it's it's obvious as well. But a PFF rush grade of 87 for Travis Gibson, that was one of the best in all of football. Only 61 for, for Muhammad. And if you're not familiar with PFF grades, um, 60, I think, is like the baseline average or, or like, um, you know, a, a replacement level player is 60. So that was only slightly above that. Uh, sacks. Um, Travis Gibson at, at 10, uh, PFF counts half sacks as a full sack, uh, for their, uh, purposes, which I actually like, because if you, um, beat your guy and got to the quarterback, who cares? Why is it a, 
matter that another player also beat their guy? Why do you get penalized because another player also beat their guy? So I think that actually makes sense to not count half sacks. Uh, I get why the NFL does it, uh, but in this case, I think when you're comparing players, um, just count that as a whole sack. So 10 sacks for Travis Gibson, only seven for Muhammad, obviously in a lot more snaps. Uh, QB hits um, went to Muhammad. I don't know why I have that highlighted green for Gibson, but that's whatever. Uh, hurries were Muhammad, total pressures for, were Muhammad. Again, that's mostly just because he had so much, so many, so many more snaps. Um, if you look at the pressure rate and pass rush win rate, um, eleven point eight percent pressure rate for Gibson, thirteen percent pass rush win rate, eight point one percent pressure rate, and eleven point eight pass rush win rate. Again, I don't know why that's not a percentage, um, but clearly favors Travis Gibson there. Uh, when you're looking at the run defense, I do think Muhammad's a little bit better right now. And, I, and if there is an area where I have concerns about Gibson holding up over the, the course of the year, it is in the run defense. Um, he certainly, I don't think he was bad, um, but the numbers, you know, say that he was only at least average as a run defender, whereas Muhammad was much better um, uh, with uh, the PFF run grade 63.4 to 50.8, more tackles, more assisted tackles. Um, he did have a higher missed tackle rate, uh, but he also had more run stops. Um, as well. So um, I think when it comes down to it, Gibson is going to ultimately win this, but it's just will be, will be interesting to see how much this coaching staff values familiar, familiarity with the scheme over, um, you know, potential and, uh, and pass rush ability. All right, so that's the stats. So let's look at the tape. Um, here I have a, a video. I'm going to start with Travis Gibson here. Um, so they kind of win in different ways. Uh, they're different players. Uh, but they're kind of they're competing for the same spot. Uh, Gibson here on the left side of the screen. He is uh, uh, as we as I've mentioned a much better pass rusher, and he wins. Uh, he can win as a pass rusher in a variety of different ways. One thing that really sets him apart from Muhammad is his ability to bend around the edge. You hear about uh, the bent, the ability to bend a lot when you talk about pass rushers. The hip flexibility, uh, just the overall flexibility of, of Gibson is far superior to that of Muhammad. It doesn't mean Muhammad's a it can't be a good pass rusher and isn't a good, a decent pass rusher at least. Um, it's just the, the way they win is different and Gibson wins in a more valuable way. Um, so again, he's on the left-hand side of the screen here. You can see the bend here. He barely gets touched by this, by this right tackle. Little inside move here uh, before uh, dipping his shoulder and bending around the edge. Um, so he did that consistently um, during um, last, last year. Um, I think I have another one. I don't know if this is the right one or not. Bear with me. Yeah. So you can see the bend, the hip flex, flex uh, the um, ankle flexion he gets. I wish I had the other angles. I probably should have gotten the other angles. Uh, but you can see how he's able to bend around, um, get small. You can see that 45-degree angle that he has his body at. That's not something that Muhammad does very often. It's not something every pass rusher can do. You know, Robert Quinn's very good at this. Um, Khalil Mack was good at it. Um, uh, Travis Gibson is good at it as well. That ability to bend around the corner um, and create pressure around the edge, um, forcing that quarterback to either get sacked like he's there or step up into the pocket and make an early or check down um, to, um, to, a, uh, to a check down option. When we look at Muhammad, he was an example of him. He is kind of getting around the outside of the, uh, the left tackle here. So he's on the right hand side of the screen. Uh, but he's not exactly bending around there. But you can see he he just wins it in different ways. He uses his length a lot more efficiently than Gibson does. I love to Gibson has long arms. I love to see him use his arms and his length um, more effectively as a pass rusher. Um, and it's this is something that Gibson could probably learn from Muhammad because he does it uh, pretty well. So you can see how he gets he uses this long long arm technique uh, very well. But he's able to get his arm into the chest plate of the left tackle. Um, and he's able to get around the corner. So you can see he doesn't have that same bend um, that that Gibson has, but he's still able to beat his guy to the outside uh, just with more power rather than with bend itself. So we can watch that again at full speed. Um, so he's able to get around the corner and, and not quite get a sack, but force a force an errant throw from the quarterback. Um, we look at another one from Gibson. This is another example of how he uses his length. So this is a uh, uh, same game. But you can see how he's not able to get around the edge of this um, offensive tackle, but he is able to use a long arm technique to be play with more power rather than finesse that Gibson does. So let's watch that. He's on the oh, um, I should say he's on the left hand side here of the screen, lining up against the left tackle. 
So you can see again how he gets his arm extended and into the chest plate of the of the offensive lineman. And instead of beating him around the edge, um, which he's not able to do, he's able to uh, use that long arm technique to kind of get to overpower him and get to the inside of this um, offensive tackle um, and get to the quarterback for a sack. Uh, so this is a really impressive pass rush. Again, they're both decent. Pa uh, Gibson's a great pass rusher, um, or good pass rusher at least. Muhammad, not as great, but he does show these flashes of consistency. And I think actually in a more reserve role where he doesn't have to play every down, I think he could become more efficient as a pass rusher. Um, make sure that he, you know his legs are fresh and he's not rushing the passer 50 times a game. Um, I think in a reserve role, um, his sack total might go up a little bit or his pressure rate might go up a little bit. Whereas Gibson, you know, in a full-time role or a starting role, his pressure rate might come down a little bit. Um, but I think both of them are really nice players, and I'm excited to kind of watch them battle uh, in training camp and in the preseason and see who comes out on top. So that's as a pass rusher. Um, we can talk a little bit about the run defense as well. All right, so let's get into the run defense. So I'm going to start with the Mojave here. So this is a game against the Tennessee Titans. Obviously, the, the Colts and the Titans are very familiar, both playing in the AFC South. Um, but uh, the Colts actually did a really good job defending against Derrick Henry and the Titans rushing attack. And the Titans, as we know, have a very good rushing attack. And we know Derrick Henry is a very good running back. Uh, but the, the, uh, the Colts did a very good job containing uh, Derrick Henry. I think in two games, they held him to about three yards per carry. Um, he only got over 100 yards in one of the games. That's because he had 28 rushes. Um, so all in all, considering it's, you know, one of the best running backs in football, if not the best running back in football, uh, they did a very good job containing Derrick Henry. And Muhammad was a big reason for that. Um, so here he's at the bottom of the screen. He's actually uh, not the bottom of the screen, but he's the, the last defensive lineman on the bottom of the screen. So he's kind of being covered up by a linebacker here. Uh, but you can see how uh, in this instinct, in instance, um, he uses his length really well. And I'm going to go over a couple different ways that Muhammad was able to stop the run in this game. Uh, this one was, you know, through his length, um, stacking and shedding a tight end um, and making and wrapping up Derrick Henry for uh, a tackle for loss or a tackle right at the line of scrimmage. So again, he's at the um, the right here, the the uh, defensive lineman at the bottom of the screen. You can see how he gets in the body of his tight end. Uh, he uses his length well, so you can see how he uses his length to separate from that tight end. Um, he's going to be two gapping here, so he's. Um, able to separate from that tight end um, and stop Derrick Henry for, for no gain. So this is the same thing from the other angle. So here is um, Muhammad. So you can watch him. He's going to right. He's head, heads up on this tight end. Again, he's going to come out of his stance low with good leverage, good wide base, and he uses his length to extend and uh, stop Derrick Henry for, for no gain. Obviously, there are other guys in there as well um, who made that play happen, but Muhammad was also was a big reason for making that play happen. All right, so another way that uh, Muhammad won uh, was, so there he won with more power. Um, here he's going to win with quickness. I believe he's on the left-hand side of the screen here, um, lining up over the left tackle. Uh, but he's going to uh, just use his quickness to avoid the block and get into the backfield. So we can play that. Kind of froze there. Let's play that again. So, yeah. So he's going to just go right around that left tackle, get into the backfield, and tackle Derrick Henry one-on-one, -on -one, which, is, as we know, is not very easy to do. Uh, so there, rather than power, he used his quickness to win. This was showing up a lot when I watched him. Um, I do think, you know, he's a very good run defender. I know his PFF grade was only like a 63, 64 or something, uh, but I would, grade, I would say he's a better run defender than that score indicates. Um, and he, again, did it a lot. He can win in a lot of different ways when that run game, either with finesse or with power. Um, and then this other last one, same, again, this is the same um, same game, um, same, um, same offensive line, same running back, Derrick Henry. He's going to be the backside defender here, so he's going to be unblocked. Uh, but you can see how quickly he diagnoses that this is run play. He doesn't, think, he doesn't hesitate for the play action. Uh, he diagnoses run very quickly. And he's actually able to lay a pretty big hit on Derrick Henry, which is very impressive. So again, here at the bottom of the screen. Um, so again, the backside defender there, unblocked, but is able to diagnose this play very quickly. Um, and th this angle just shows how big of a hit it was on Derrick Henry. And Derrick Henry's not a small guy. Derrick Henry, as we know, he's like 6'3", 250 pounds. Um, so laying a big hit like this on him and decleating Derrick Henry um, is very impressive. Um, so yeah, so again... 
Muhammad, very good run defender. I think he was a better run defender than he's giving credit for. Uh, not so much of a pass rusher, but I think in a in a reserve role, um, he can really up his game a lot more by playing less snaps and being more efficient with the snaps that he does play. Okay, so on the Gibson and run defense, I don't have a lot of videos of Gibson defending the run, uh, but I do have one here, um, and that doesn't mean there aren't other examples. I just um, didn't get the clips of all of them. But this is a really good example of how he... Um, how he defends against the run. I mentioned earlier how he, how he doesn't use his length as much in pass uh, brush in the passer as I think he can, uh, but he does a good job here using his length uh, to run uh, to defend the run. Um, I also misspoke earlier when I was talking about uh, Muhammad. I said he was two gapping. The Colts actually do not run a two gap um, defensive scheme. The Bears in 2021 did run a two gap scheme, um, so that's where he's defending multiple gaps, whereas the Colts are defend the defenders are defending one gap. Um, but you can see what kind of the difference here. Um, so he, he's, again, if you don't know, Travis Gibson, number 99, lined up over the right tackle. So he's going to get his hands onto the into the chest plate of this left tackle, and he's going to be two-gapping. So that means he's... Let me uh, get my pen. So he's responsible for this gap and this gap. Um, whereas um, in the... Um, the Colts defense, the line, the defensive linemen and linebackers are just re responsible for one gap. So he's going to use his length to keep the uh, defender away from his body. And you can see how he's he starts to the inside, closes that gap uh, before getting to the outside and defending that gap as well. Um, so this is a really good example of um, of his run defense ability. Um, it's not something he. It's definitely something he needs to improve upon, um, and it's. It's not something that I think will get better with less with more reps. Uh, if anything, it'll you know could get a little bit worse. Um, but I think he has so much pass rush potential and ability um, that you can't afford to keep him off the field. I think he should be the starter. Uh, but you see, this is a very good rep from him uh, to defend the run. All right, next up, we're moving from the edge to the interior. We're looking at the defensive tackles that the Bears will have. This is probably the area that they're the weakest at. Um, they really don't have anyone who's that good. Um, so if they, uh, their defense struggles this year, it's going to be because up the middle, they're not generating the pressure up the middle and they're not able to stop the run. Um, that being said, uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of the, when I did my rewatch of every Bears game and every snap of every Bears game, uh, one of the players, actually the player I was most, I came away most impressed with was Angelo Blackson. I thought he played extremely well last year. Um, and I think he should be starting at either at three technique or nose tackle. He's kind of interchangeable. He can kind of play both spots. Um, he should absolutely be starting based on who they have um, at those positions right now. Um, he's so much, a lot more experienced than Kairos Tonga um, at nose tackle. He's obviously also been ex way more productive than Tonga was last year um, at nose tackle. He actually was ex way more productive um, at defensive tackle than Justin Jones was last year. So Justin Jones was the their big defensive line um acquisition this year after the Larry Ogunjobi uh, contract fell through because of the failed physical. Uh, but as you can see from these stats, uh, Angelo Baxton actually completely outplayed Justin Jones last year. Um, and and um, I, I, I like Justin Jones. I don't want to pick on Justin Jones. I'm mostly just pointing out how well Angelo Baxton played last year. So you can see the pass our snaps. Baxton had a few more, uh, but pretty similar um, sacks. Baxton had more QB hits, more hurries more total pressures, a higher pressure rate. So that takes out the uh, extra, you know, 30 or so um, pass rush snaps that Blackson had because he had a higher pressure rate. Pass rush run rate were pretty similar, but Justin Jones did beat him out there. Uh, but that pass rush run rate, the pressure rate um, that Angelo Blackson um, generated was pretty good. Uh, in run defense, it's not even close. Um, and Blackson had a much better year, more tackles. Uh, less missed tackles, less missed tackles percentage, more run stops, and a higher run stop percentage. So Blackson played extremely well last year. Uh, I think those are your two um, starting defensive tackles, Justin Jones at, at probably the three technique and Angel Blackson at the nose tackle. Uh, but I think they can, the nice thing about them is they can be pretty interchangeable. Uh, Justin Jones can play the nose position. Angel Blackson can play the three technique. Um, so I like that combination. Um, as much as I can, you know, both these guys are, are fringe average starters at best, I believe. Um, so it is definitely a weak link of their um, of their defense. But I'm excited to see 
kind of the cap battles that that, that happen uh, here. So Tonga is, is going to give a chance to start only at nose tackle. He's not he's not a, a three technique at all. Uh, interestingly, they also have uh, Mario Edwards, um, who is going to be competing for that three tech spot. Um, he had a down year last year. I don't have his stats up here. He had a down year last year, but two years ago, he played extremely well for the Bears. Obviously, in a 3-4 uh, two gap scheme, which is different from what they're going to be running now. Uh, but I think he is probably their best pass rusher. Um, so he could easily, I could easily see him um, being a rotational three technique on obvious passing downs. Um, maybe Luke moving um, Justin Jones to, um, or Angelo Blacks into the nose tackle position and letting him rush the passer from the three tech spot. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see. I'm mostly not seeing who's going to win the, the job. I mostly want to see how they have that rotation set. Um, if they're going to be using Blackson and Jones interchangeably, if Tonga is going to be uh, playing on early downs, is Mario Edwards going to be coming in, in on obvious passing downs, um, stuff like that. Um, um, so we can kind of see um, how that works out. So I'm going to go into a little bit of, of tape just on Angelo Blackson. Um, I'm not going to go into Tonga and Jones, but I just want to show kind of the things that I saw when I did my re. All right, so let's start with Blackson. Um, let's, let's start taking a look. Let's start with the run defense um, for Blackson. So I have a couple of plays here. Here he's lined up as a uh, one technique nose tackle. Could potentially be a two eye technique, actually. He might be on the inside shoulder of the guard. Uh, for anyone who's not familiar, I'm sure most people are, but zero technique nose tackle is lined up right over the, right over the center's face. One technique on either side would be um, lined up over the shoulder. Two eye technique is lined up above the inside shoulder of the guard. Uh, two technique would be lined up right over the guard. Three technique, which obviously you're here a lot and you have heard a lot, is lined up over the outside shoulder of the guard. Um, so that's where, like, I've been talking about Justin Jones playing. And then you have um, four eye technique. Oops, not great. Four eye technique is lined up on the outside shoulder of the tackle. Um, Four technique lined up over the tackle and five technique, which I'm sure you've heard of uh, in the Bears old scheme and their three four scheme. Five technique is lined up on the outside shoulder of the right tackle, and then there's the seven six nine technique that doesn't make any sense um, for the edge players. But but that's what you'll see. So the Bears uh, usually would line up with two five in in years past uh, would line up with a zero or one technique nose tackle and two five techniques in their base scheme um, under. Um, uh, Matt Eberflus, they're going to you're going to see um, the three technique a lot more um, in their base scheme as well as a zero one technique. Now, obviously, the Bears, even though they ran a three four, were a nickel lot, so you'd also see a lot of three and two eye techniques. Uh, but I'm just talking about their base scheme. Uh, but we have Blackson here lined up as the nose tackle, um, so that's you know where I have him projected to play to start. Um, so he's lined up, actually, um, this is against the Browns. The right guard of the Browns is Wyatt Teller, who's one of the best right guards in football. Um, so this is a run play, and you can see uh, if we watch Blackson, he's able to, uh, it's a one-on-one -on -one with Wyatt Teller. So he's going to get up into his chest and uh, very stout against the at point of the attack to make the tackle in the backfield. Um, so that's just one example. I have a couple more. So this next play is probably a better example of what uh, Black will be facing as a nose tackle. Um, this is, he's lined up as a two eye technique here. And he's gonna face a double team from the right guard in the center. Uh, but you can see his ability to fight through those double teams and still not get blown away. Um, he does need to get better at this. There were times when he was blown away from double by double teams and just completely erased from his gap. Uh, but he does a good job here and he's done and shown some flashes of, of getting better in that regard. So he's able to, to take on the double team um, against extends his arm, his arms keep the defender away from his body, two gap and defend multiple gaps um, to get Joe Mixon to the ground. So we've seen that he can win with power, uh, but he can also win with finesse and quickness. Um, and he did this a lot um, against the run in twenty twenty one. This is he does a really nice swim move over the center. So he's lined up as a two eye technique here. Um, maybe maybe he's supposed to be a one technique. Because uh, interesting, I think he's supposed to be a one technique because you got the three technique over here, but it looks like he's lined up as a two eye technique. But anyway, it doesn't really matter where he's lined up. Um, but he does a really good job with a swim move over the center um, to make a play in the backfield. And he did this a lot. So you can see that swim move. It's a little bit blocked by the camera there. Um, but the swim move 
uh, to beat the center, and then the athleticism um, to um, jump from the ground and fully extend to make this tackle for loss. Uh, just a really impressive play. He did this a lot um, um, last year. So here's another example. He's lined up uh, over here. So it looked like he's lined up as was a, a a four technique. So right over the head of the right tackle. So does the same thing here, a swim move, and then the uh, you know the motor to track down the ball carrier. Um, so uh, swim move from the backside. Um, so again, I, there's multiple examples of this. He did this um, a lot last year, um, and it just shows his quickness and his athleticism. So here. He's actually lined up as a three technique here. Um, so again, he can be interchangeable, lined up as a three technique or a nose tackle, not one technique. Didn't play much zero technique, but he won't need to do that um, in Abu Flus' scheme. So one technique, anything from a one to two eye to three technique, uh, he should be able to handle. He also played a lot of five technique, obviously, in the Bears 3 4 scheme. Um, but you can see that swim move and the ability to get in the backfield, uh, the finesse. Um, I think I even have. Uh, more of those, but you get the point. Um, he did that a lot, um, that swim move to to make a play in the backfield um, for a tackle. One more example of run defense, and then we'll get into the pass rush, but I wanted to include this one as well because I talked a lot when I was doing the offensive tackle. Um, uh, I was talking about Larry Borum and Tevin Jenkins about getting their hands on the chest plate and controlling the defender. Well, the same principle on the other side of the ball. So we have... Uh, Angelo Baxton here lined up as a four technique right over the head of this tackle. Uh, but you can see how he uses his long arms to to get into the chest plate. Maybe it's a little high, might be a bit close to the, too close to the face max, but he gets an arm on the chest plate of the tackle and is able to control him um, rather than the offensive lineman getting his hand on your chest plate and controlling you. Um, so that long arm, that those long arms, the long arm technique um, and stacking and shedding is something that he really did excel at. Um, in 2021. And something that I think, you know, regardless of what technique you're playing, you're going to have to stack and shed. Um, so this is just a good example of that. All right, so now we can get into uh, the pass rushing from Blackson. Um, obviously, you know, he's a defensive tackle. He's going to have to 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 win with power most of the time. Um, so here he is. He's lined up as a five technique over here over the right tackle. Uh, but he's going to go up against the guard. Um, what he does here is just a straight bull rush. So he does have that power to bull rush guys. Um, doesn't make the doesn't get the sack, but does get a QB hit here um, and forces a check down. Um, so that was a really nice play. When he can't win with power, he actually did flash a pretty good spin move. Um, so here's uh, one example. I have a couple of examples of this. Uh, but here he is lined up as the four eye technique. So on the right side of the formation. So really good spin move there. He did flash this a lot. Uh, spin move, again, it's Kyler Murray. He doesn't make the sack, but does force him out of the pocket. Um, and that's really all you could ask for out of a D-tackle. But he does have a very good quick spin move. Um, so he did that a, a bunch of times. He never really got a sack off that, but he did get a bunch of pressures. And this particular one, he was held. So again, number 90 over here. Can't see the guy throwing the, the ref throwing the flag, but they did get a holding penalty called against uh, them on that play. Uh, that's just as good as a sack, if you ask me. I believe I have one more. I can't seem to find it. Okay, maybe I don't have another example of, of the spin move, but it is something that he broke out uh, pretty often and, and to pretty good success. All right, so here's the example of the, the one more example of the spin move. So again, lined up over the right tackle. Uh, but he's going to be going against the guard. So again, doesn't get the sack here, but does get a QB hit. Uh, really good spin move that he he broke out uh, from time to time. And I'm excited to see how that would work more coming from that three technique spot um, and see if that's still possible, uh, see if that's still uh, um, um, something that will work from that. Spot. All right, one more uh, for Blackson. So, you know, we've seen the bull rush. We've seen the spin move. This is another good example of a pass rush move that he has to offer. So here he's actually lined up as a three technique. Um, so uh, it's some a place where he might you know most likely be lining up uh, from time to time under Ma in Matt Eberflus's Ibu scheme. You have Eddie Goldman lined up as a one technique, um, and then you have uh, a five technique, which is Bilal Nichols, I believe. Um, so you have a three tech, but, but we're gonna look at Blackson over here, the three technique. And what he's gonna do here is he's going to use that length again. 
Um, so he's playing the run to start. Um, as the Ravens obviously run very run heavy team, um, you got to be disciplined. You can't be getting out of your out of your lane. So he's playing the run at first, using his long, his arms to to kind of sneak into the backfield. Once he realized that this is a pass, he then the, uh, uses what's called the push and pull technique. So he has the defender, uh, the offensive uh, guard at a distance, and then he's going to pull him and use a swim move to get over him. And he's actually going to get held. You can see the the uh, ref throwing the flag. So again, that's just as good of a sack. He actually forced a lot of holding penalties um, last year, which is impressive for a guy who's not considered a, a very good pass rusher. Uh, but he was held, I have you know, about four or five examples just in here of him being held. Um, so that's pretty good. But this is just a really good uh, rep from Angelo Blackson. Um, really makes you think that he could be, a, uh, you know, could play some three technique uh, because he has that ability um, uh, with multiple pass rush moves. Um, so hopefully that's something that the, the Bears can develop and, and keep him. All right, so the last position we're going to look at is slot cornerback. It's really the only position in the defensive backfield that's up for grabs at this point. Eddie Jackson and Jaquan Brisker are pretty much locked in in safety. Jackson for sure, Brisker most likely. Um, and then you have Kyler Gordon and Jalen Johnson at the two outside cornerback spots. And then the slot cornerback is pretty much a toss-up right now. Um, there are three guys who I think have a chance to earn this spot. Um, that is... Um, Tavon Young, the free agent from Baltimore. Um, I do think Thomas Graham is going to have a chance to compete for that spot. He played well in a very small sample size last year on the outside. Um, so it'll be curious to see how he fares on the inside. Um, I'm not sure if that's something he was really asked to do much in college. I know uh, he didn't play there much at or if at all last year. And then the third guy who I think is going to be able to, who should at least get a chance to, to compete there is DeAndre Houston Carson. I do think he's one of our better defensive backs. And if he's not going to start at safety, I'd like to see him at that, uh, potentially at that slot corner spot. So let's take a look at their stats from last year. Um, you can see um, DeAndre Houston Carson probably fared the best out of all of them. Um, obviously, Thomas Graham did play very well, but that's just such a small sample size. There's not a whole lot we can garner from those stats. Uh, but if you just look at DeAndre Houston Carson versus Tavon Young, at least last year, Houston Carson played uh, pretty substantially better than Tavon Young. Uh, the thing I liked about Carson, uh, Houston Carson, because he didn't, he's, he's a very sound tackler. He doesn't miss many tackles. And for your slot cornerback, you really need them to be physical and a really good tackler. So you can see he only missed 4%. His missed tackle percentage was only 4%, whereas Thomas Graham was at 16%, and Tavon Young was at 9%. Um, so that's something that I really value out of a slot corner. And I think the Houston Carson, um, seeing how he is a safety, it makes sense that he's he's a, a good tackler. Uh, he also allowed a lesser pass rating, only 76.7 uh, as compared to 107.6 for Tavon Young. Um, and I just think he played extremely well um, it, when, when called upon. And he's a guy who I think has gotten better each and every year. Um, he started out as just really a special teams guy. Uh, but the more and the more... He, he plays um, actually on defense. The more, uh, the better he gets, and the more impressed I, I am with him. So I think he should definitely have a chance to compete for that starting spot. If he doesn't uh, get it, then he'll he's a very solid backup. If um, Eddie Jackson gets hurt or if Triple Crown Visker maybe struggles out of the gate, uh, you know he is a rookie, uh, but second round rookies bust all the time. So I'm not saying Brisker's going to, but it is a possibility, and we're lucky to have DeAndre Houston Carson as that backup. Um, who can fill in admirably, um, and sometimes even even more than that. So let's take a look at um, let's start with um, let's start with Thomas Graham just because he has the least amount of. All right, so Thomas Graham, um, I do have some video here. Of course, the very first video we look at, I just said he didn't play much in the slot, and the very first video we're going to look at is him playing in the slot. Um, so it's been a very long day for me. <laughs> if you can't tell, if you can't tell by the lighting in my room. It's much later in the day than when I when I started this endeavor. I blame the Bears for making, uh, for uh, for signing people right after I finish recording my half the podcast. So, uh, but here he is. He's in the slot here, um, at the bottom of the screen. Um, so the Vikings are going to run a slot fade here, um, and he actually does a pretty good job. I can nitpick a little bit, but he does make good play on the ball. Um, so I'm going to hit play. So again, bottom of the screen. He does get beat a little bit, not as physical as I would like, but he does make a good play in the ball. A couple of things here. Uh, one, I want to see him kind of get his head around here. 
and make a better play, uh, maybe even uh, intercept it, but he does make a good play on the ball to break up the pass. The other thing I want to see is I want to see him be more physical at the line of scrimmage here. Um, he's playing in the slot, but the guy's on the line of scrimmage. I like to at least have him get at least a hand on him right off the bat there. And you can see right here, he starts extending that right arm um, to get on the, the wide receiver's shoulder, which is good. That's exactly what, what you want to do, I would like, but I want to see him get a little bit more physical and kind of uh, use that arm to kind of get him to the sideline. Use that sideline as, as another defender, um, but he doesn't really do that. Um, he doesn't really do that, and, and the and the wide receiver is really able to get past him. Uh, this is really just nitpicking because he did, you know, make a nice play on the ball. Uh, but if he did use his arm to kind of push him more to the sideline, that just makes it a much more difficult throw for the quarterback. Um, and this play was, you know, inches away from being completed for a big game. Um, so just a small thing there. Um, but overall, for a rookie sixth round pick, um, very good, very good rep from from him. With just a, with just a. Uh, few uh, spots where he can improve. So next play, he's not in the slot here. He's playing on the outside. It's at the bottom of the screen um, here. Um, but it is man coverage on the tight end. Um, so obviously, if you're playing in the slot, um, you might be matched up with tight ends from time to time. So the fact that he's able to match up with this tight end here is, is a good sign. So he's playing. Um, so it looks like uh, it's hard to tell. I, it, this side of the field is definitely playing man coverage. It looks like he's playing some sort of zone coverage. Uh, but it also might be man coverage with just an outside leverage with the safety help over the middle. Uh, it's hard to tell for sure, um, but that's what I think is happening. Uh, outside leverage, man coverage, and then um, with the safety over the middle to help out. So we're going to play that here. See him dropping back. And he does a good job of, of reading the quarterback and reading the, the tight end uh, to jump the route and break up the play. Almost an interception, but still a very good play to break that up. Uh, we have that here from the other angle as well. So here he is, number 27 at the left side of the screen. Uh, the tight end, you know, does a little outside move, to sell the, but doesn't really sell the route very well. Uh, but Young makes a great play to, to break. Okay, so what about in zone coverage? So this is a Tampa 2 that the Bears are running. Uh, we know Matt Igbefus runs a lot of zone. Um, Probably going to be a little more zone heavy than man heavy than we were in the past. Uh, but Graham does a good job in zone as well. Again, small sample sizes. But here he's at the top of the screen. Um, so they're running um, a cover two or a Tampa two. So Graham's covering this area. He's keeping the guy in the flat in front of him. Let me, I'll just draw this out real quick. So it looks something like this. Tampa two, that middle linebacker is going to get a little deeper than in a normal cover two. Um, so what's going to happen is the Vikings are going to try and attack this area of the field. So there are three areas of the field you want to attack on cover two or Tampa two. It's right there. They're going to go after this spot. Um, and Graham does a nice job of taking that away. So let's hit play on this. So we're going to watch uh, Graham at the top of the screen. This is a great play because this is actually a cover two beater that they're that they're running. That's exactly what the, they got exactly the look that they want. But Graham gets good depth here, and he's able to read Kirk Cousins' eyes. Um, he's got he's got this check down in front of him, uh, but is able to get back and break that play up. So if we diagram again, let's we do this again. Cover two. Real quick. They're going to run a corner route with this guy. This guy's going to chip and then break out into the flat. So Graham is really responsible for covering both of these guys, uh, which is not easy to do. Um, and he kind of baits the baits Kirk Cousins into, into taking that shot into that turkey hole um, by playing a little bit shallow, uh, but does a really good job of... Um, getting himself in a really good position to break up that play. So let's just watch that again at full speed. Pretty good play from, from a rookie there. So if Graham is going to win this uh, slot cornerback job, he has to be more physical. That's something that I really want to see more out of him, not only in coverage, but also in run support. Um, 
he did a very small sample size. He did miss one tackle and had five tackles. So um, very small sample size. But I, it's not an area um, that I think he's strong in and really needs to get more get better uh, in run support if he wants to win that job. So that's going to be something I'm really looking at in training camp. Sometimes In training camp, it's going to be difficult to, to judge physicality. But definitely in the preseason, that's what I'm going to be watching from him, how he comes up in run support. Uh, but it's not from a lack of trying. Um, he do, is willing a willing tackler and willing to stick his nose in there. Um, so this we have, uh, they're just going to run um, a run to the outside with Dalvin Cook. And you can see, oh shit, let me go back. Um, oh jeez. Alright, well you have Thomas Graham at the top of your screen. There we go. Thomas Graham at the top of the screen here. We'll play that. You can see how he comes up and is willing, a willing tackler, um, does a good job there. I like to see him more of a wrap-up tackler rather than just diving at the knees. But when you have Dalton Cook coming at you, sometimes that's the only thing you can do. Uh, but he is kind of the last line of defense there. So I want to see a little bit better form tackle. But he is willing to come up and, and hit. Um, he's just, a, you know, a little um, little undersized, but undersized. Maybe he needs to put on some weight. Uh, but it and it is something he's going to have to work on. That's that's my knock on him is, is his physicality. He needs to be more physical. Um, at pressing at the line, more physical at the stem in his routes, and more physical in the run game as well if he wants to win that starting job. So we'll start with Tavon Young where we left off with Thomas Graham um, in the run support area. Uh, so this is actually a, uh, a touch pass, but it's essentially a run play. Uh, but you have Tavon Young. Um, he's going to be right here, um, and he's going to come up and make a, a, a play behind the line of scrimmage. Um, so Let's see what that looks like. So they're going to bring the man in motion for the touch pass. And you can see Tavon Young not only uh, makes the tackle here, but is pretty disciplined, not allowing any cutback lanes, uh, but does a good job of coming up and making a tackle behind the line of scrimmage. That's what you need out of your slot cornerback. They need to be able to play the run just as effectively as they play the pass. Uh, it's probably the most uh, most difficult position to play, I would say, on, on, the, on the, at least in the defensive backfield, because you're tasked with doing so much. Um, you have to be equally adept at run support as you are uh, in the past, and Young has shown uh, throughout his career uh, that he's willing to tackle and is a pretty good tackler as well. Another thing you want to see out of your, your uh, slot corners is the ability to blitz, and Young does have uh, a good amount of sacks in his career. So here he's lined up, in the, again, in the slot where he usually is. Um, he did actually play a lot outside this past year. I think it was because of injuries um, that the Ravens had, uh, which might explain why you know he didn't have the year that he's really known to have. Um, but here you have it in the slot, and he's just going to be coming off in a slot blitz. Um, does a good job of not not telegraphing that, um, not telegraphing that, and not giving away what he's going to do. Um, so you can see he lays a pretty big hit on, on Carson Wentz here uh, that he didn't see coming. So uh, again, Tevin Young, really good blitzer, really good in run support, um, and I think that's what the what uh, Ibuflus uh, is going to be looking for out of that slot corner position. All right, so what about in coverage? Obviously, um, slot cornerback is going to have to cover people as well. Um, so here uh, we have him in the slot at the top of the screen. And they are going to just run a slant. Uh, he's going to make a nice play on the ball. Um, you'll see um, that he's a very, very physical, uh, not only at the line of scrimmage, but um, into his route. Um, very Much more physical than Thomas Graham showed. Um, and that's something that you need to be if you're... Uh, want to be a starting slot corner in the NFL. So again, they're going to run a slant here. But you can see right there, you can see how physical he gets. It's within five yards of the line of scrimmage. You can be a little bit more physical with them there. Um, once the ball is thrown, he's able to sneak his hands in there to break up the play. Uh, really good rep from him. You can kind of see from here, at least the pass break up. The throw's a little bit behind, uh, but still a nice play to get his hand in there and break that up. Uh, but the physicality is really something that stands out with Tavon Young. Um, and it's a reason why he's been in the league so long. Uh, it also might be the reason why he's usually injured uh, because he's, he is a little bit more physical. So uh, if he can hold up for the entire year, um, I think he'd be a, a pretty good slot corner for them. Okay, so one more on Tavon Young here again. He's in the slot and he's covering um, Tyler Boyd. Pretty good receiver. Um, and they're going to be just in straight man coverage here. Um, so I chose this play because I wanted you to watch his footwork here and how he mirrors the receiver's feet. Um, it's really impressive by him on this play. I have it slowed down a little bit here. So you can see how he mirrors his feet, stays square, and is able to stick with Tyler Boyd and break up the play. 
Um, so I just think that's a really nice rep and really exa good example of how you mirror how he mirrors uh, the wide receiver's feet in coverage uh, to stick with him and not allow him to create separation. Um, so again, uh, with Tav when it comes to Tavon Young, he has, he has the physicality, he has the coverage skills. Uh, it's just a matter of health with him. Um, he's missed two full years um, with injury. He's missed countless uh, other games, not countless other games. He's missed other games throughout his career too. Um, he just needs to stay healthy. Um, who knows if injuries will catch up to him, but I do think um, the Bears could do a lot worse than Tavon Young as a slot corner um, if, if he wins that starting job. All right, the next guy we're going to talk about is DeAndre Houston Carson, actually the last guy we're going to talk about today. Um, I know he's a safety, um, but I think he is a dark horse candidate to, to win that starting spot as a slot corner. Um, I think he has performed there well in the past. Uh, he's kind of played both positions, um, primarily safety, but a little bit of slot corner as well. Um, so I think that's a position he could play uh, and start in the NFL. Like I said, he's gotten better and better each year, um, and I think the Bears could do a lot worse. So on this particular play, we have him in the slot. Um, so I, as I mentioned, he is a safety, but he has played, does have experience in the slot as well. So he's covering, uh, they're gonna drop into zone coverage. Uh, but what I like about this play, again, I've talked about it with the last two guys, um, so it's only fair to talk about him, is the physicality and the tackling. Um, so this is, um, it's not quite a mesh concept, but it's a similar idea. Um, what the, let me get my pen. What the Packers are doing, and these guys are going up, and they're going to send um, Aaron Jones on kind of a little slant here, almost like a, a, a mesh concept, but not really. Similar concept, though. Um, so DeAndre Houston Carson does a good job of, of recognizing that and coming up and making the tackle, and an open field tackle on Aaron Jones like that is not easy. It's not an easy thing to do. That's a guy who... Um, the guy who makes a lot of people miss and makes a lot of people look silly. Um, and you know this play was designed by the Packers to get him matched up one on one with with one of these guys, either either Al Ogletree or DeAndre Houston Carson. They wanted to take advantage of that mismatch. Um, they did exactly what they wanted to do. I just don't think they expected DeAndre Houston Carson to make this open field tackle. I mean, look at how much space is between him and the next closest defender. If if he, Houston Carson doesn't make this tackle, it's a possible touchdown. If he gets the right lane, or if it's at least another 20 yards. Um, so he does a good job of making that open field tackle on a running back, which is not easy to do. Uh, more physicality from DeAndre Houston Carson. So here he's at the bottom of the screen, I'm circling him now. Um, so he's playing safety here, but he is close to the line of scrimmage like a slot cornerback would be. Um, but the uh, uh, 49ers are going to run a sweep to Elijah Mitchell, Mitchell here, and he does a very good job of filling his lane not over pursuing and just kind of being patient letting the ball carrier come to him because he knows he's he's in his lane he knows where the running back's going to be he knows where where the target is for the running back on that sweep um and he just fills that hole um and is able to to make the tackle so again very sound tackler that's what i want out of my slot corners um and you know and we're getting to the coverage a little bit later but the fact that he you know is good in run support can make open field tackles um is is a good starting point for a uh, starting slot corner Okay, so what about in coverage? Um, it's obviously where, where defensive backs make their money. Um, here we have, he's actually, uh, I like John Houston Carson because he can cover tight ends, he can cover running backs, and he can cover wide receivers. Uh, this is an example of him covering a tight end, one of the best in the league. He's matched up against Mark Andrews um, on in off-man coverage, uh, which is an interesting play call from, from the Bears considering how close they are to the line of scrimmage, or how close they are to the uh, end zone. Uh, but the Bears are going to bring a blitz, and each, and they're just going to be lined up in, in man coverage across the board. Uh, that's a lot of room to give up in the red zone like this. Uh, usually when you're in the red zone, you want to see guys more, you know, closer to the line of scrimmage pressing, especially when you're blitzing like that. Uh, but it works out because the actual Houston Carson makes a really nice play in the ball here. So uh, Mark Andrews here is going to run a crosser. Houston Carson's going to pick it up and make a nice play. We'll just play that. So you can see the cross there. Um, and he just reads that right off the bat and closes very quickly on that ball and breaks up the play. Um, as you can see, the ball's a little, this is just a different angle. Ball's thrown a little bit behind, but still a very nice job to get his hand in there. Not arrive too early. Good discipline there not to get there too early. A lot of guys will, you know, just go for that big hit. Uh, 
but he makes sure that he doesn't arrive early and is still able to get his hand in the ball, in there to make a play on the ball. Uh, and on a very difficult play, because as I mentioned, you don't see usually off-man covers like that uh, inside the 10-yard line. That's that's asking a lot out of, out of your safety. I'm sure the, when the Ravens saw what, how the Bears were lined up, they were, uh, they were uh, very excited about that. But Houston Carson made a nice play there to break that up. Similar uh, thing here. Uh, the Bears, again, are running man coverage. Houston Carson here going up against Cam Brait. A decent tight end, not of the uh, caliber of Mark Andrews, but pretty good tight end. He's gonna just going to run an out route at the at the goal line. Um, again, playing off man. Um, and Houston Carson put in a difficult situation on the off man on the, uh, inside the 10 like that. Uh, but does a really good job of breaking up the play here. So you can see how, again, he mirrors his feet a little bit. Not as uh, textbook as Tavon Young did uh, when I showed that earlier. But does a pretty good job and is able to, you know, again, get his hand in there to break up the play. He doesn't arrive too early, doesn't grab, doesn't hold. Um, just makes a really nice play on the ball. Um, so this is another uh, play. This is going to be in more man coverage. Um, and I chose, this is actually a completion given up by Don, DeAndre Houston Carson, but I do think it was still a good rep. Um, he's matched up in man coverage against um, Chris Godwin. So obviously, you know, one of the better receivers in football, one of the better slot guys uh, for sure. So we have DeAndre Houston Carson. They send uh, Chris Godwin in motion. Houston Carson runs with them. Tom Brady knows this is man coverage. He knows exactly where he's going when before this ball is snapped. He's going to target Chris Godwin, one of his best receivers, against a backup safety, backup slot corner. He's playing uh, slot corner here. Uh, but he does a very good job. As I mentioned when I was talking about Thomas Graham, how I wanted him to be more physical on the route. This is a good example of what I mean here. He's physical without getting grabby. Yeah, maybe got a little grabby there. But no, play uh, pass interference was not called. So in my opinion, it's not pass interference. Uh, but gets physical at the route there. Um, and you can see um, Chris Godwin has actually to, has to come back to the football because there was such good coverage there. Um, and Houston Carson is able to make the open field tackle. So he gives up the reception. Physical gives up the reception to a very good receiver, but doesn't allow any yards after the catch. Um, so that's just something I like to see. Again, that sound tackling is, is going to be so key for the Bears. And it's going to be something that Matt Eberflus really um, expects out of his slot corner or anyone on the defense, really. All right, so that's it. Uh, I did a lot more talking today than I thought I was going to do. Um, I know I said I was going to do a Michael Schofield and uh, Riley Reef breakdown earlier. Um, this is, podcast has already been way too long. But I promise you I will do one of those later in the week. I'll have two podcasts this week because I already have all the film cut up and everything. So... I just got to record it. Um, so I'll do that later this week. But those are the matchups that I'm looking at. Those are the matchups and the players that I'm looking. I'm going to be paying close attention to um, in training camp. Obviously, Justin, I'm going to be paying attention to Justin Fields as well. That's really what this you know whole thing rides on is, is him progressing. So um, obviously, I'm going to be paying attention to him. I do want to do a Justin Fields breakdown soon because I do have have watched a lot of tape on him as well. And I think I have a good understanding of what he does well, and, and but also what he needs to work on. Um, I've seen a lot of, you know, videos on, on Twitter and, and YouTube about how great Justin Fields looked last year. Um, and he did look great and did make some incredible throws. But every player need, has things they need to work on. And I think I have um, kind of come up with a few things, a uh, few examples of things that he needs to work on. So I do want to do that as well. That's going to be coming in the next couple of weeks. Um, otherwise, next week, I'm also going to probably do a training camp recap um, of the first week. I will be at training camp, as I mentioned, on Saturday. Um, so any, if anyone wants to stop by and say hi, I would love to talk to any Bears fans that are there. Um, I do have an extra ticket, as I said earlier, if someone wants to message me um, and get that extra ticket, I'm happy to send that to you. No cost or anything. Just just let me know um, you want it and I'll send it to you. Um, but yeah, really excited for training camp to get started. I love doing these breakdowns, but it's going to be nice to actually break down current tape and the right scheme and everything like that. So once the season starts, I'll get I'll be more consistent with my videos and everything. Uh, but anyway, hope you guys enjoyed and bear down.